Good afternoon. Hello. Welcome again, uh, everybody, with this third webinar already in our series of uh, for, uh, regarding hydrogen, together with Hydrogen Europe. My name is Leon Stiller. I'm uh, the general manager of the Energy Delta Institute, part of New Energy Coalition. Uh, today we're going to talk about uh, the, uh, the EU perspective and Hydrogen Europe's perspective on the hydrogen as a key to a fully integrated uh, energy system. Uh, I will be joined to, to, together with two experts from Hydrogen Europe. Uh, we'll, we'll, which I will ask to join in a minute. Uh, Alexandru Florestran is the legal and project manager, and Konstantin Levojanis is head of policy. They are uh, remotely uh, in uh, in Brussels uh, uh, with us today. Hello, Alexandru. I see you already here. And uh, maybe Jan Konstantin, you can turn on your camera as well, so we can at least see you guys. Hello. Hopefully, you hear us uh, well also. Yeah. Excellent. I hear nice. you very well. Thank you very much. Congratulations um, for your my name, by the way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll always try to make sure that the name at least I pronounce right. So that's always a good start. Um, we will have this webinar in two parts. So the first part will be more a bit of factual, uh, where Alexandru will explain uh, about the, uh, the role of hydrogen in the integrated energy system from the perspective of the European Commission and what's happening over there. Uh, the second uh, part of the webinar will be by Constantine, and he will be talking a little bit more about the Hydrogen Europe's recommendation and outlook on, on the role of hydrogen in an integrated energy system. Uh, as always, you can ask questions during the webinar. Uh, we, I will let the two speakers have their talk first, and afterwards we'll have a, a nice conversation with the three of us. If you use the chat function in uh, GoToWebinar, uh, I will see them here on the screen, and I will uh, ask the, uh, the speakers to... Uh, to react on the questions. So with that said, I would say, let's start with you, Alexandru. Excellent, thank you so much. So let's put the slides up as well, because before starting about starting to talk about the EU regulations that, that enable an integrated energy system, I really wanna take some time to explain what really means an integrated energy system. I think this is, very important as this understanding of what an energy integrated energy system means sets the stone tone for everything that we do in, in in the energy sector so before i explain it from a hydrogen perspective i want to start with the, the the only definition that actually matters is that commission's definition for energy system integration for them it means linking all energy carriers with each other and with all end use sectors. The key word here being energy carriers, not sectors. Now, the main purpose, why, why do this, is, uh, is to allow the optimization of the energy system as a whole, uh, rather than decarbonizing and making separate efficiency gains in each sector independently. Now, in the in, in in the past couple of years i have to admit we've shown this picture that, that everybody sees to so many people uh, on so many different occasions uh, some of you may have already seen it and i i personally feel that we may have overused it but despite our overuse of it this picture has never been more relevant than than today nor closer to actually becoming a reality so the first thing i want to say is this Hydrogen in an integrated energy system is not just a bridge between electricity and gas. What it is, is a separate energy carrier that will become a globally traded commodity, traded at scale on liquid markets. Markets that if we are smart and if we act fast, may be denominated in euros, not in dollars, not in uh, anything else. But Let's look at this picture from, uh, from, from the left. Let's start with the electricity uh, sector, with the electricity as energy carry. This is everything that you see in, in blue. Now, from the electricity perspective, an important element of energy system integration is the decarbonization of production with a strong focus on uh, prosumers, on decentralized demand side responses, on smart grids, on multi-directionality and on digitalization. These are the key elements from the electricity's perspective. Now we are of course talking about an electricity sector dominated more and more and more by renewable electricity from both stable as well as from variable sources. I 
said this before last time I spoke with, with EDI and, and on other occasions, and I will say it again. If you can generate, store, transport, and use renewable electricity as electricity, you should absolutely do so. We will need a massive upscaling of renewable energy generation capacity. Uh, we will need increased grid capacity. We would need further electrification of end use se sectors. And if you can avoid energy conversion losses, let's do so. But what happens when we simply cannot avoid this? What happens when electricity cannot reach an end use sector or is simply not enough for that end use sector? And this is where hydrogen comes in. And this is everything that is in orange in, uh, in the picture. The first thing you should see in the upper left corner of, of the map is an off-grid renewable energy uh, production plant, a, a hydrogen renewable uh, plant, if you will, generating hydrogen at, the, at full capacity. Why is it off-grid? You ask, well, because there was simply not enough spare capacity on the e-grid to allow it a connection. And the developer made a business case to produce renewable energy and sell it in the form of renewable hydrogen. That's why. Why do we need it? We need it because we need more renewable energy generation capacity and we need it now. We cannot wait for the electricity grid to catch up nor for the electrification of end use sectors that are not ready uh, or, or need time to catch up. We need to move at scale now. Uh, just below uh, this part is a renewable energy production plant. You can see it's a sol solar plant this time that is connected to both the electricity grid as well as to an electrolyzer. Now, this can maximize the value of the energy production more than the off-grid solution actually because the plant owner can inject electricity in the grid when prices are high turn on his electrolyzers when the electricity prices are low in addition to that you can have an additional revenue stream by selling demand side response services and helping the e-grid remain stable and functional now this is energy system integration at its finest now, we have in the in Hydrogen Europe's intelligence team have played with this business model uh, a lot. We can be real nerds uh, sometimes. We looked at actual electricity spot prices across entire years, at different potential hydrogen prices, at many other variables. And I'm the first one to say that it is not easy to find that sweet spot that maximizes your revenues between hydrogen production and electricity production and sale. There are many variables. Uh, the point of maximal value will vary. But what I can say with a large degree of certainty is that with the right regulatory framework, you will be able to make a profitable business case out of it. Now, the third thing in the upper left corner represents imports. Uh, on this figure, you see it in the form of a ship. Uh, but it can also be, and perhaps even preferably, uh, in the form of a pipeline. It will all depend on where the import, import comes from. Why import? Well, that's simple. Uh, Europe is and will be a net energy consumer. And hydrogen imports allow us to, 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 to diversify the choices of suppliers to basically anywhere you have wind or sun. And it allows us to, to, to shop for the best price. Uh, it allows us to use it as a foreign policy, policy, foreign policy tool in relation to our neighbors, bring prosperity, stability, investments, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it won't do, it won't be able to, what hydrogen does actually is not make us self-sufficient, but it gives us all these options um, that, that we have to, to diversify our energy sources. Now, finally, on the right side of the picture in, in relation to hydrogen, you will see hydrogen produced from natural gas or from other low carbon, but not non-renewable sources. The only way this one makes sense is if the CO2 is captured and stored or used in, 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 its, in, its, in its solid form. So why hydrogen from hydrocarbons, you would ask? Honestly, because like I said, we're nerds and we ran the math. We ran the math like everyone else. And 
there's not enough renewable electricity to go around. That's what everybody else is saying, and we agree. Uh, so in the short term, it is needed. And again, we need to act now on the decarbonization agenda. There are other ways to produce renewable or low carbon hydrogen as well, uh, from biomass, waste, uh, nuclear power, uh, even using the grid, uh, and which is actually a very important production pathway as well. And these will play a role as well, depending on the business cases. But for the sake of time, I restricted myself to talking about the first four. Uh, four. Now that you have produced your hydrogen, just like electricity, you should always try to use it as hydrogen. It is the same analogy. Why using hydrogen as hydrogen? Because just like with electricity, you have energy conversion losses if you transform it again into something else, like transforming it into e-fuel, transforming it into synthetic methane or any other energy carrier or fuel. Preferably, by the way, you should also try not to burn it for its calorific value, but rather use it for its chemical properties which make it more valuable. So this is why we need a dedicated storage and distribution network for hydrogen as hydrogen, a network managed just like other systems by system operators. Now, the role of dedicated net networks will be to bring this pure hydrogen to its consumers, to heavy duty, think refinery, steel, ammonia, cement, they're all on the picture. Uh, these are consumers of hydrogen at scale to the different transport applications that could not electrify, think heavy duty aviation, maritimes, those that could theoretically electrify but would rather not, taxi fleets, uh, long distance commuters, drivers in cold climates, and to the share of tr the transport market that simply cannot be served by, by electricity and the electricity grid. Here I'm thinking more of the aspect of scale because it's much easier to, to electrify a few percentage points of the transport fleet uh, but close to impossible to, to service 100% of it. I'm also thinking of those that operate in off-grid areas. Finally, as another example of energy system integration, you also bring that to the heating and power of, of buildings, supplying those that cannot install or cannot afford a heat pump, for example, or other electricity-based uh, solutions providing uh, backup power. The final use of hydrogen, that of blending with natural gas, brings me then to the right side of the graph where we have today's natural gas infrastructure. Its production, natural gas, and its use will continue to play an important role in an integrated energy system. There is no doubt about that, but this is a transitional one. Just like with electricity, hydrogen allows a higher and faster penetration of renewable energy in our total energy consumption. And hydrogen in an integrated energy system allows us to gradually replace fossil natural gas with renewable and low carbon gases much faster than would otherwise be possible without hydrogen. Hydrogen and gas will, for a transitional period, flow both in to parallel networks, as I said, one dedicated to pure hydrogen and also one which blends increasing uh, shares of, of, of natural gas with other renewable gases until finally the entire energy system comprises of only carbon-free energy carriers, renewable electricity and hydrogen. So I'm really sorry for the very long introduction, but I felt it was necessary to, to, to set the stone. So we can we can go to the next slide. And finally, go to, to saying, why is this so relevant? Why did I say it's never been closer to being a reality? Why is it so topical? Because the new European Commission made climate action and hydrogen for climate action a political priority. Here you can see just some of the recent statements at the highest political level cementing the view that clean hydrogen is one of the top priorities of, of Europe's energy transition. On, on, on this slide, I won't stay too long on it, but I like very much Commissioner Simpson's view that action and support for hydrogen technology has multiple benefits. One of achieving climate neutrality while still providing economic uh, benefits. I'd like to move on to the next slide, which brings us to the legislative and non-legislative tools that the Commission will bring to make this vision this political vision a reality. 
And uh, I want to start by saying that there are many, many EU acts that impact positively or negatively the deployment of hydrogen technologies in Europe. There are mo a lot of those that deal with technical safety, uh, compliance, and other requirements associated with the use of hydrogen. These are explained in, in, in the reports that we published under the HILO project which can easily be, be, be open uh, and accessed freely on hilo.eu. Uh, but of course, when it comes to political importance for the future, these pale in comparison with what is to, to, to come in the next period. So next week, on the 8th of July, we'll bring a landmark change to the policy landscape in Europe in relation to, to hydrogen. The 8th of July, will be the first day when, when mainstream EU policy and legislation will no longer view hydrogen as either an industrial gas or a niche alternative fuel. Finally, for the first time, it will be made a key element in an integrated energy system. And this is why it's a paradigm shift in the way hydrogen is treated by EU policy. So, what you should be looking for. Three things, the communication on energy system integration, the EU hydrogen strategy, and the launch of the European Clean Hydrogen Alliance. There's a reason why all these three are launched on the same day. They go together. So let's tackle them individually. And let's start with the energy integration uh, package. The high-level objectives of the package itself are explained by the European Commission in their consultation roadmap and, and, and in their descriptive website. So the main objective, as I said earlier, from the Commission's perspective, is to optimize the energy system as a, as a whole, rather than looking at, at only small parts of, of the system individually in isolation. The Commission wants to use every opportunity available to reduce emissions at all levels, which means one, greater direct electrification of end use sectors, fair enough, but the use of renewable and decarbonized fuels, including hydrogen, in the right place at the right time. A more circular, uh, decentralized and digital energy system, a more multi-directional system where energy flows not just between energy carriers, between electricity and hydrogen, hydrogen back to power, hydrogen to heat, but also between consumers and producers, depending on the situation. Think, uh, think, think waste, think pro, uh, prosumers. And finally, the commission wants to empower consumer choice. And this consumer choice will no longer mean choosing your supplier of electricity or choosing your supplier of gas but choosing the energy carrier that best suits your needs, depending on the situation. This is the paradigm shift, and this is why it's so important. Now, if you're like me, a little bit of a nerd, you're probably thinking uh, this is very blah, 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 high-level political aspiration. Uh, what does this actually mean in practice? So let's go to the next slide, because what actually means in practice is less explained by the Commission in, in, in their public uh, communication. But we can infer, based on the public statements that they've made so far, we can infer on their Commission's work program, if we look at it, what kind of legislative acts they will be revising and what legal concepts they will play with to achieve their objectives. Now, on this slide, this list is by no means comprehensive. I don't say it is, but I wanted to highlight just some of the elements that are at stake concretely when it comes to hydrogen within an integrated energy system. Now, the first one is the creation of an energy, energy, not electricity, not gas, an energy market design. Uh, whether this will entail the revision of just the gas package or whether it will reopen the recently revised electricity market design legislation, to be honest, is still unclear. What can be said is that important elements will have to be designed for a system that is expecting hydrogen. And these are 
how to avoid double taxation, double fee payment for energy that flows through several energy carriers, from the e-grid to the hydrogen grid to the gas grid. This will have an immediate impact on how electrolyzers function and how fees, taxes, and levies are paid and who will have to pay them. The other question is how do we organize retail markets for, for energy, rules on cross-border exchanges, and many, many others. The other extremely important issue from a legal perspective at stake in the, in the system integration perspective is what framework will be applied for the infrastructure. So in this case, similar elements that are relevant for the other energy carriers become relevant for hydrogen as well. What will be the unbundling rules for hydrogen? Who will be allowed to own and operate different parts of the value chain and under what condition? How will access to that infrastructure, both for producers as well as for consumers, be ensured and guaranteed? What will be the role of national regulators and, 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 and the role of ASA? And of course, and perhaps most importantly, who and how will undertake the, the, the planning and ensure cooperation within the entire energy system and across borders? They are difficult questions that the commission is trying now to answer with, with their strategies. Um, we will all know more on the 8th of July. Now, we go to the next slide. It gets even more interesting when we talk about the elements at stake within the EU hydrogen strategy. I won't take too long because Konstantin will explain further. But what I want to do right now is say that, just illustrate the importance of some of the questions that will be tackled in this. So we'll have terminology with clear definitions of what constitutes renewable, low carbon, and clean hydrogen. We'll have uh, we'll see the Commission's plans on how to support production and at the same time incentivize consumption. They will clarify uh, on which types of hydrogen we can expect such support. And, uh, and, and finally, of course, they will say something about consumption targets or quotas to, to, to different sectors where hydrogen is, is, is relevant. I guess I don't need to mention why such measures are, are important. Now, the strategy is also likely to speak about the continued role of, of research and, and, and innovation, explain how the planned Clean Hydrogen for Europe partnership can support uh, the strategy. I wanna make a little bracket here to my uh, fact-based presentation and say that research and innovation supported through the fuel cells and hydrogen joint undertaking is perhaps the reason why we are able today to speak about such concrete market developments and not refer still to hydrogen as the fuel of the future. While it got us this far, research and innovation in the sector will continue to play an essential role. Now, finally, we have investment planning and, and, and the commission will probably uh, very likely explain how much we need to invest, in what sectors, when and by whom. So the reason why I put this part last is that, not to lower its importance, but the fact that it's connected with the, the next slide, with uh, the Clean Hydrogen uh, Alliance. Now, the main deliverable of the alliance is to generate the pipeline of key projects that will enable the take up of hydrogen in all areas. So we're looking at an organization around six roundtables, around six different areas of the value chain, from the production of hydrogen to its distribution and end use in four different sectors. Again, you see the logic, a system perspective. So we have, of course, uh, involvement of the commission at, at a high level uh, of CEO, council president, regional ministers, et cetera. Now, um, as I mentioned before, I cannot stress enough how important these developments will be for hydrogen uh, in, 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 in the next uh, week. And hopefully, I, I thought it was useful to whet, to whet your appetite ahead of next week. So I will pass the floor 
to the head of policy in, in Hydrogen Europe, who will walk you through uh, Hydrogen Europe's main recommendations and our own views on all these developments and how we as representatives of the industry and as representative of hydrogen as a sector system, uh, what we want to see from the upcoming policy and legislative act. Constantine, will you take it from here? Thanks, Alex. So um, to piggyback off what Alex said, I think it's important to really state from the get-go, never before have we seen this level of support for hydrogen. I don't just talk about political support, but from industry as well. For example, in June just past, more than 100 CEOs from across the hydrogen value chain signed a letter sent to the European Commission expressing their readiness to support the Clean Hydrogen Alliance, which you've just seen the governance structure beforehand. They sent a clear signal they are ready to get to work and kickstart the hydrogen economy. It's a massively important signal. The Commission has responded positively to this call. The fact that we have a dedicated hydrogen strategy communication accompanying the energy se sector integration a publication is testament to that fact in itself. Now, we know it's not the first time that hydrogen has been put forward as a solution, but we also know that this time it's different. Why is it different? The technological developments, the rapid cost decline in renewable energy, and the urgency to achieve the climate targets, not only at EU level, but at global level. This sets a new impetus for hydrogen. Moreover, the corona crisis has put more pressure on the policymakers to deliver on the Green Deal. Alex talked a little bit about electrification. It will be an important pillar that drives us to meeting our targets, but electrification alone is not sufficient and we can't put all our eggs in one basket. We need electrons and we need molecules, clean molecules. In the past, We've heard a lot about natural gas being the perfect partner for renewables. I would argue that in today's context, the narrative is evolving to favor hydrogen and renewables partnership. Renewables have their limitations, whether it's regarding land use, availability, uh, transportation over large distances, we, as a hydrogen sector, want to help renewables to continue to grow. We can help them do that. This is the basic essence of what we refer to as hydrogen renewables, so bringing together hydrogen and renewables. So, ladies and gentlemen, we've reached a tipping point for hydrogen. And what will that require to drive us past the tipping point? It will need investment an enabling regulatory framework, sustained research and development, infrastructure, and cooperation with third country partners. So as such, and in view of the hydrogen strategy, we have developed 10 recommendations that I'll be taking you through now. And I see that the, the first slide is already there. So what's the starting point? Starting point is the definitions. Alex already alluded to that. Is the starting point for everything because without definitions, we can't have legal certainty, we can't have investor confidence, we can't address basic things like how do we link the support schemes to renewable hydrogen to low carbon hydrogen. And this has been a hot topic of discussion ahead of the publication of, uh, of the hydrogen strategy on the 8th. What do we think about all of this? We need a clear methodology to calculate life cycle greenhouse gas emissions of hydrogen. Today, we hear a lot about the different colors of hydrogen, blue, green, yellow, turquoise, even pink, I've heard. What counts at the end of the day is the CO2 content. Hence, we, we, we establish a principle of CO2 as the new currency of the energy system. That's what counts, is the CO2 content. Now, besides the methodology on, on certification, just to wrap up on the previous slide, we need a robust 
tracking and tracing system. We need a separate scheme of guarantees of origin for hydrogen. If we're to fulfill the vision of hydrogen as a commodity in Europe and on the globe, hydrogen must be treated separately from other gaseous carriers. Um, certify there is on the slide there. I'm sure some of you, if not most of you, are familiar with Certify. It is a certification scheme that's been developed. Um, we do believe that this could be taken as a good starting point for the thresholds uh, that I mentioned earlier. Uh, moving on, Alex began to talk about quotas and targets and stimulation programs uh, for hydrogen. Now, some examples of what kind of quotas and targets could be set. An industrial quota for carbon-free steel, ammonia, methanol, other chemical products is something that we've been pushing for. In parallel, we believe that a transport quota for carbon-free kerosene, for shipping bunkering fuels, for hydrogen powered trains, and for hydrogen transport and fuels in general, should be something that we see from this strategy on the 8th of July next Wednesday. And moving on to enable a competitive hydrogen economy or to build a clean hydrogen economy and a gigawatt electrolyzer market, it requires a European hydrogen market design where the development of regulation needs to be agile and fit for purpose. A mature hydrogen market will only exist if and when there is enough demand in the various end uses and a hydrogen backbone infrastructure is in place. Now, several actions can be taken in the short term, but in the medium to long term as well. We know that this isn't something that's going to develop overnight, so we have to take a step-by-step -step approach. What can we do in the short term? Is we really need to get the, uh, the trading of certificates uh, up and running. We need the guarantees of origin scheme. Today, we have different approaches of national issuing bodies uh, of guarantees of origin. This can lead to fragmentation and it can hamper broader trading related aspects of hydrogen. In the, in the long term, or in the medium to long term, the EU, we should have EU-wide guarantees of origin. But in the short term, what the EU can do is propose guidelines to national issuing bodies to encourage common practices and standards and try to mitigate the different approaches being developed across the member states. That's for us a quick win and something not too imposing from the European Commission. Guarantees of origin need to be supported by a robust track and trace system, as I mentioned before. And in the short term, as we, as we envisage some hydrogen imports coming in from abroad, that's something that the EU could take a more active role in. In the medium to long term, we need auctions and tenders for the production of renewable and low carbon hydrogen to get hydrogen volumes into the market. We need a hydrogen price index based on a pricing panel whereby market parties on a regular basis give their hydrogen trading prices. And we need to start up a hydrogen trade exchange at part of the hydrogen backbone, which we will develop. Europe needs, this is an important point, Europe needs to be the starting point for hydrogen as a global economy, as a global commodity. The world is looking to us. I'm not exaggerating that point. We are going to be the first movers tackling legislation, regulatory framework for hydrogen. So we have the opportunity to set a regulatory framework that can be transferred to other geographies, set up a, a level playing field across the world. That's what's known as the Brussels effect. While setting up this regulatory framework, we form the foundations for that global market and for hydrogen as the global commodity. And last but not least on, on this slide, if we want Europe uh, to be more economically powerful on the global market, we need to do what the Americans did with oil. We need to index the price of hydrogen to euro, not the dollar, not the yen, but the euro. We're the first movers. 
we're the first ones to, to develop the legislation, to develop the market. We should do it in Europe. And that brings me to the infrastructure point. Europe has a huge advantage compared to other continents. To a very large extent, we have succeeded over the last decades in developing a regulatory framework that has enabled investments in cross-border energy infrastructure, connecting the north to the south, east to the west, vice versa. In the gas sector in particular, with regulations such as the Trans-European Network for Energy Regulation and Security of Gas Supply, we have solid foundations of an internal energy market based on security of supply, competition, and sustainability. Now, today, the sustainability component is becoming more and more important, and we will see this becoming very prominent in the upcoming review of the Trans-European Networks for Energy Regulation. So from a hydrogen perspective, the first thing we need to do in, in the TENI, in the Trans-European Networks for Energy Regulation, is ensure that as part of the development of a 10-year network development plan, member states should list and report their plans, clean hydrogen, hydrogen interconnection points into that network planning. That's number one. The sustainability criteria fulfillment for projects should be linked to the greenhouse gas methodology that is to be developed, what I mentioned earlier. What else do we need? We need clean hydrogen, clean hydrogen networks as its own thematic area. New infrastructure projects, as well as hydrogen transport solutions, whether we're talking about uh, pipelines, or roads, maritime, intermediate storage, associated infrastructure projects, they should be encompassed within the TENI framework. The last point I want to make on TENI is, is very important. Today we have, we have the TENI and we have the TENT, which is the Trans-European Networks for Transport Regulation. At the moment, you have work being done on TENI and work being done on TENT. We need to put that together. If we envisage developing hydrogen as a commodity for Europe, more so as a global commodity, we need to make sure that the 10E corridors match up to the 10T corridors. We need to take the hydrogen production from the source, through the infrastructure, the pipeline, to the refueling point. So that's, it seems obvious, but it's not until now. So this is really a key point that we've been driving um, in, our, in our communication ahead of, the, ahead of the launching of the strategy next week. And I wanna, I wanna give an example actually, because this isn't just theoretical, this is, this is on the minds of investors. And I give you an example of the ScanMed corridor. Um, Italy is interconnected very well to North Africa. SNAM, the Italian uh, gas infrastructure operator, the big, one of the biggest in Europe, if not the biggest, has plans to import cheap hydrogen from North Africa through their infrastructure. And companies like Iveco and Scania are making investments into hydrogen refueling stations along, along the 10E corridors. So this isn't just theoretical, this is beginning to happen. And I give you this concrete example of the, of the ScanMed corridor. Linked to this, we actually need that hydrogen is recognized as a in the mandatory list of fuels in the uh, deployment of alternative fuels infrastructure directive. Today, it's not. The situation was different some years ago. Hydrogen wasn't as high up on the, on the agenda. This is another quick win or another quick way to make sure that we have uh, that we solve the chicken and egg problem. We need to get hydrogen on the, on the mandatory list of fuels of the, of the DAFI. Alex talked about the fuel cell hydrogen joint undertaking. That will be called the Clean Hydrogen Partnership um, under the next EU budget. Today, there is, a, there is an approach whereby 
The Commission believes that the Clean Hydrogen Partnership should uh, tackle production and transport related issues. We believe that this partnership should take a value chain approach. We need to have a clean hydrogen partnership that tackles production, transport, and end uses. It's a very simple and clear message. In terms of barriers, uh, I want to give a couple of examples of barriers that we have today that need rectifying. The Renewable Energy Directive today, it sets a 14% target for renewable, renewable fuels in transport. It gives multipliers to electric, electric solutions and to biomethane, but there are no multipliers for hydrogen. Again, this is a case of, this was done a couple of years ago, the situation was different, and now we need to update that. Another example is taxonomy. In the taxonomy regulation, we basically have a proposal that says clean hydrogen production is sustainable activity, but the transportation of it through a pipeline is not because an investment in a natural gas pipeline, or it's not defined as natural gas, it just says pipeline, is considered unsustainable. So we've been fighting to create clarification on that point. You can't have the production without the transportation. You need to be able to retrofit, convert pipelines or build new ones in order to get the hydrogen where it needs to go. Whether you're talking about private networks in clusters, whether you're talking about long distance or again, retrofitting of existing pipelines. Where are we gonna get the money? So we need to unlock innovative financial instruments. I talked about 10E and 10T earlier, the funding tool for 10E and 10T is the Connecting Europe Facility Regulation. So in the same vein, we have clean hydrogen networks being proposed in the 10E. We need to have a budget line for clean hydrogen networks in the Connecting Europe Facility Regulation if we're gonna be serious. Another thing we need to talk about is, is the important projects of common European interest process, IPSE. We believe that in order to really kickstart this economy, we, we, we shouldn't wait. We should get going as, as quickly as we can. If projects, if IPSI projects can be submitted to the Commission by the end of this year, state aid rules should be waived for those projects. They're projects of strategic significance for Europe. They contribute to our energy objectives. They contribute to, to employment, to our industrial policy. And the IEA came out and said back in May, after the corona crisis had hit in, that we need to support two technologies in particular in our recovery programs. Batteries was one and hydrogen was the other one. So if we're serious, we need to think equally seriously about this kind of innovative financing. On the Clean Hydrogen Alliance, I want, I want to mention that if we imagine that there's going to be regulation next year proposed for a hydrogen market design, let's do the math. So the negotiations in the interinstitutional process at EU level is going to take three to four years. So that means we won't have regulation, we won't have legal certainty until 2024, 2025. I beg to differ because I think the fact that we already have a hydrogen strategy sends a signal to investors but also this formulation of a clean hydrogen alliance that is supposedly going to be a CEO level alliance. This is the place where, we, where the projects will be discussed, where the projects will become real. You will have the whole value chain sitting around the table and talking about the projects and, and how we're gonna move forward. So between now and between now and the formalization of the regulation, the Clean Hydrogen Alliance is really going to be the platform that gets the investments going. One last thing I want to talk about on the previous slide before you change is this concept of hydrogen in climate diplomacy. Now, what do I mean by that? For years, we've been import dependent. We, we still are. 
it means we've developed significant import capacity from our neighboring countries. We have important trade relationships with them. That those relationships form part of our neighborhood policy or foreign policy, if you will. So there is a real geostrategic element to consider here in terms of how we use these developments to further nurture our relationship with our existing partners and how we can bring them along with us. So we need to continue the dialogue. We need to use the fact that Europe is in the driving seat for, for the development of these industrial technologies. These technologies, whether you're talking about electrolyzers, for example, it's, it's a European technology. We're in the lead. It's made in Europe. We can export those technologies to our partners to help them achieve their own targets under the Paris Agreement, to help them achieve their sustainable energy goals, to get clean air. It's in order to, to keep that re those relationships moving forward and in order to, to work together to achieve the Paris objective, this is a way, hydrogen is a way for Europe to, to really lead on, on climate diplomacy. And last slide, this is just really to, to cap things off uh, in terms of what's happening from now until the end of the year and what, what are we expecting next year. So we have communication on a renovation wave coming up. That will deal, among other, with residential fuel cells, uh, the retrofitting of boilers for hydrogen use, and hybrid heat pumps and electric heat pumps, yes. There will be another communication on sustainable finance. That's where we're going to be able to tweak the irregularities that I mentioned earlier, particularly on the infrastructure side related to to hydrogen. And a couple of other things that I really want to point to are the offshore renewable strategy, which is super important, particularly from the renewable hydrogen point of view, we expect integrated model or integrated business models of offshore wind being connected directly to electrolyzers and then taken via via pipeline to refueling stations or end users in, in industry. This is really an opportunity to see what I called hydrogen renewables in practice. It's a great opportunity again to bring us to bring us together. 10E revision is coming at the end of the year in December. And next year, in June, we will have the hydrogen regulatory framework proposed. So this year is the year of vision. What's our vision for hydrogen? And next year is going to be, all right, now we need to put the rules in place. So that's going to be next June. And at the same time, we'll also be reopening the renewable energy directive as well. And that brings us to the end of our okay. presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Constantine. I think we are, we're a bit tight for time, so let's just continue right away with some questions. Because I do think you, you guys managed to explain uh, and tackle a lot of the questions already, so that's why I kept you talking. This was very nice. Um, there are some, some people here that, that are watching and saying, OK, uh, that's great that we, have, we are working on hydrogen and that it has such a potential and that it, it is really into the EU DNA almost, or it will be in the EU DNA at some point. But why now? Because uh, from the 70s, this has already been, uh, uh, yeah, been proposed, you know, so have the characteristics changed that much? What changed, basically? Is it still a hype? That was one of the questions. I think I'm, I'm going to tackle that, and I think that was one of the first points that I, that I mentioned. Maybe I, I wasn't clear enough. Um, the technological developments have advanced so much since the 70s. I said that it's not the first time we've heard about hydrogen. Um, mm -hmm. It's different. The technological developments are unprecedented. The cost of renewables is declining rapidly. And we have these targets now clearly in, in, ingrained in our, in our political declarations and in our legislation. Mm -hmm. Not just yeah. the EU saying climate neutrality in 2050. Or it's just clearer now. Or 55% yeah. greenhouse gas reduction targets in 2030. Some countries have already said we're going to go for 65. 
So if you're, if you're serious about achieving those, those targets, you can't just do it with electricity. And natural gas consumption is going to uh, decline post-2030 by all estimates and analyses that we've seen. And you can't do mm -hmm. it without fuels. And hydrogen is the only clean, uh, gaseous form that can, that can support this to scale. Yeah. So it's basically a sense of urgency. At the one hand, it is the policy that has changed. Uh, so the, 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 it is more embedded in our, in our system and we need to do this right away. Maybe that comes me to an, another question is, uh, what about time? So you mentioned already, okay, this can take a long time before you have an actual uh, functioning legal framework. But how do you see that happening with hydrogen? Uh, will it take 10 years before we are at 100% or will it take five years or what is the timeline? Well, that's, you need to start developing projects yesterday. That's, that's the answer to that. So not only the, the reaching the targets in 2024, 2025 and 2030, but that means you need to have started thinking about what projects you're going to build uh, you need to have done it uh, last month because mm -hmm. funds are being structured right now in order to take a project from the first project idea to financial close takes takes years and the financial support is already being developed now and is available. You know it's going to come. You have to start putting projects mm -hmm. on the ground now. That's the framework, not in 10 years, not in five years. It's now. Yeah, but even, but even in so significant hydrogen, uh, for example, that that fifty percent of uh, uh, of the targets on hydrogen are met. Do you think that will be quick? Is it years or ten years or decades? Or do you have any idea about that? How quickly we will have hydrogen on the networks, for example? We will have uh, hydrogen in the networks in the beginning in the, of, of this decade, not the next. That mm -hmm. is something that needs to happen. And like I said, and the only way that happens is that if uh, we build that pipeline of projects, of mature projects, mature concrete projects of hydrogen production, of hydrogen uh, distribution and of hydrogen consumption, we start building them today, the pipeline, we mature them, we bring them to financial close within a year or two, we access the funding and we put them on the ground within the first half of the next, uh, of this, this decade, which means in the second yep. half of, of of the next decade, then they, they start becoming operational. Already we're mapping, we're mapping a large list of projects, especially in the area of, 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 of production. It's not enough and it's not what where we want to be. We want a lot more, but you can already see the maturity of a lot of large companies in Europe that understand this and are, are bringing large projects in terms of production, distribution and consumption close to financial close. This is where you want to be. And, and yep. we want to work with, with everyone in the, in, in the industry to make sure that we help them reach financial close and start building. Yeah, I think indeed, like you mentioned, there's an unprecedented wave of enthusiasm and support, for, uh, the monetary support as well for hydrogen at the moment. So that wave needs to be ridden, so to say, to, uh, to make it happen. Um, maybe another question is, uh, sorry, Constantine, you wanna? I can add something really quick. I mean, the, the testament, uh, you know, should prove that this is really happening. I just want to give a, a comparison. Maybe a year or a year ago, hydrogen was something that was being looked at very intensively from a gas infrastructure point of view. This whole storyline of, of what do we, how do we future proof our, our infrastructure? What do we do with it in the future? And the hydrogen storyline was very much prominent in the development of the future of, of gas infrastructure. But what makes it hugely different today, a year later, is that you have huge global giants like Ørsted in Denmark that is talking about these integrated renewable hydrogen projects. So it's not just the gas sector thing anymore. It's a whole energy value chain thing. And now you have those renewable players coming in, serious about making investments in hydrogen. I think that's a massive game changer this year. Yeah. yeah talking, exactly. about Ørsted, talking about Ørsted, Denmark wants to have an electricity system uh, of 110% renewable by 2030. How mm -hmm. are you going to 110% renewable energy sector, uh, electricity sector? You know how, yeah. and that has to happen by 2030. Okay, well, I think that's good news, right? So that at least we know now the, the flow is there. It is, it's going to happen. Um, there are some questions about legal mechanism, but I think Alexander, you tackled a few of them already. 
But what is, in your view, the most important one that we have to change right now to make sure all these projects are outside out the pipeline? We need uh, we need a clear terminology definition and certification scheme. That's why it's number one recommendation that uh, that Constantine uh, explained. We both agree. Okay. Yeah. So that's the main thing. So if we have that, then we can build from there and continue with the rest of the legal frameworks. Um, some other things are about, you know, you mentioned it already, or I think both of you have, that uh, import-export uh, question. So, uh, so, of course, we want to make as much of a hydrogen ourselves as possible, but we will remain uh, dependent on our trade relationships, which are also a positive thing. Uh, how do you see, from Hydrogen Europe perspective, this cooperation? Do you also endorse it, that we have more cooperation with different countries outside of Europe, or research institutes, for example? For a while now, we have welcomed within Hydrogen Europe national associations of uh, in, in countries in the neighborhood of, of Europe. Within our membership, we have uh, associations from Morocco, from the Ukraine uh, as well, as well as from Norway, which is okay, you would say Europe as well, Switzerland. Uh, but mm -hmm. I wanted to ask those ones, North Africa represented by Morocco and, and the Eastern Partnership by, by Ukraine. We absolutely endorse it because, like I said, we know we need it and we're not afraid to say it. We can import energy, we can export technology. It is a mutually beneficial relationship and we absolutely endorse it and, 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 and promote it as a way to, to, to achieve our energy goals, our foreign policy goals. Uh, yeah. Yeah, also because there was another question relating to the Brexit. Eh? I mean, you, you mentioned this before in another webinar. Uh, that is, uh, so of course that will change, that will have a little bit of a challenge because the UK is an important player also in, in hydrogen or will be an important player. Uh, do you see that these ties will remain very close or do you think the barriers are perhaps Absolutely. too high? Absolutely. Perhaps I think it, they will even strengthen because with, with, uh, with uh, the UK out of the political European system, I think uh, economic and business ties uh, will have to strengthen in reality because you have the, a, a less political relationship. I, as a, if I may, as, a, as someone born and raised in, in the UK, I won't be dragged into the Brexit discussion, but I, 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 what I, I let's not do that. <laughs> what I do hope is that the uh, the UK and the EU can have a relationship like the EU has with Norway. Um, you see a lot of CCS projects, in particular, in the UK taking off. We talk about the role of CCS in in hydrogen production, and this this is a personal opinion, but I I, I worry sometimes that. We don't have enough projects. Where are the CCS projects? They're in Norway. They're in the UK. They're not in Europe anymore. <laughs> so, but, um, no, I to be serious. They're all close, close by. I think so. Despite the fact that we're not in a political union, they're all very close. So I think that's also I, helping. I, I see a yeah. relation like the one with Norway. Yeah, exactly. Maybe uh, one last question because we're a bit tight for time. But is um, uh, yeah, green hydrogen, of course, is 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 the the the, the final point that we want to want to go to. From hydrogen Europe perspective, do you also look at other technologies or only paralysis? Do you also look at, uh, sorry, not uh, only electrolysis, do you also look at paralysis or other technologies? So blue and intermediate and turquoise. And All the colors of the rainbow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We do. As I said at the beginning, for, uh, I, I, I could say we're, we're colorblind, we're color agnostic. Uh, it's clear that if we're going to achieve climate neutrality, Green hydrogen is the is the end game. It's the priority. Yeah. It doesn't mean Final that point. Other, yeah. other technologies will have the role to play as well. And it's CO two content that matters at the end of the day. Yeah, and I actually want to want to add to to that as well because one hundred percent agree. I want to say something about the essence of of our organization, which maybe is a little bit different than other uh, European associations in Brussels. We have formed around the mission, a mission that we will uh, decarbonize. That's how it starts, decarbonize European energy system using uh, hydrogen technologies. That is our mission. Our members sign up to that mission and to that charter and use yeah. and 
hold hydrogen technologies to decarbonize the energy system. Smartphone disconnected. Which is why, which is which which dictates everything that we do from a system perspective, and we have members from the entire value chain, and it's something we prize dearly that we are able then to achieve this mission with support from the entire value chain and do not let ourselves dragged in conflicts between be, between them because we have to keep the mission which is decarbonized yep. hydrogen technologies those two keywords okay i think that's a very nice uh, final point it, 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 i agree with you as well also from a personal title it is about co2 reduction it is about decarbonization and any op option should be on the table so thank you very much for this uh, this webinar again and for this very interesting uh, information you've given us all uh, for this. So uh, yeah, thank you. And for all the audience as well, uh, you can download this presentation and you can look again at this uh, this webinar back uh, from the inner website of Hyden Europe and our own website. Uh, so thank you, thank you all. And uh, I would like to uh, wish you all a pleasant day. And uh, so see you for the next webinar. We have one webinar to go, which will be about innovation in uh, the hydrogen uh, world. So that's also very interesting. And uh, we'll keep you posted when that is happening. Thank, Thank you all, guys. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.